All right, welcome to our pre-recorded evening service with our peculiar providence. Uh, We will be having uh, bad weather this evening with storms and possible tornado threats, and so we thought it would, in our prudence, uh, in our judgment, we thought it would be best just to meet um, and pre-record since we were already here. Uh, A prayer request that we overlooked this morning um, was for Bobby Lowe. So if you have a moment, I would encourage you to pray for Bobby. She's at Keller right now with a possible UTI, and so uh, as our church family, we should be praying for her. Um, But I would also like to encourage you, uh, this is uh, uh, also odd, there is no service attached to this, it's just an exhortation, uh, not even a sermon. I wouldn't even call this a sermon. We do not have a worship service planned, uh, just an exhortation to facilitate and help you um, worship within your own family. And I will make some song requests or recommendations that you can look up on either YouTube or any other uh, platform that you can sing with, a fam- with your family as you study First Timothy uh, with me. Uh, but right now, as we open, uh, let's open in prayer. I'll make a song request, and you can pause the video, and then we will jump into the text. Let us pray. Uh, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, your continued care for your people, even at this time. You are the immortal, invisible, God-only wise. And we come, even on this day, um, to recognize you, to worship you within our families, and to love you within our homes. And so we pray, O Lord, that you bless our private family worship, even on this Lord's Day evening. And we lift up Miss Bobby Lowe to you, uh, that you might be with her at this time. We pray, O Lord, that you protect her. Um, from any viruses while she is at Keller, and Lord, that she recovers quickly from the infection uh, that she has within her. We pray that you be with her and the Ruggles as they care for her in this odd time. Uh, But we now, O Lord, come before you, knowing that we are sinful, knowing that we have failed to uphold your law, and as we'll see even in the text today, that we fail to lawfully use it. Uh, You have given us a good law, and we fail to uphold it even in our own lives. So spare us of these sins and the many others. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. I'd encourage you even now to pause this video in order to look up the song God Moves in Mysterious Ways by William Cooper. Uh, William Cooper was a contemporary of John Newton, and John Newton and his friend William Cooper often met to write hymns and songs. And William Cooper, uh, during his life, suffered from severe melancholy. Uh, By today's standards, we'd probably call that clinical depression, and he even was institutionalized at that uh, during his life because he tried to take his own life. Uh, But even as he uh, confessed Christ as his Lord and Savior later in his life, uh, he still struggled with that deep sense of melancholy and suffering. And even in the midst of his struggle, torment, and crisis, Cooper's last words were this, I am not yet out of heaven after all. For even in the deep depression that he often experienced, he found comfort in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to pause and to sing together uh, as a family, God moves in mysterious ways. But now we turn our attention to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we'll be picking up in verse 5 and going through uh, to the end of that section, which is verse 11. We have been working through in this passage the church's calling, and we see that Paul has called Timothy and the church of Ephesus to destroy false teaching within their midst. We heard but a few weeks ago or last week uh, that these false teachers were wielding uh, the, the doctrines of the Old Testament and creating uh, fictitious stories about them to promote their false teaching. And we also learned that they wielded the law of God in such a way that they used it unlawfully. They probably taught something akin to Christian perfectionism, that you can truly indeed live out the law perfectly. And so today, as we pick up in verse 5 and go through to verse 11, we see that Paul grants us a brief excursus. He recognizes the false teaching that is brought upon the church in Ephesus, and then he seeks to correct that false teaching with the passage we have today. So hear now from 1 Timothy chapter 1, 
picking up in verse 5. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away in vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now, in verse 8, now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Good laws can be twisted and misapplied. Many laws, even in our own country, uh, that we see seem to be good on paper, have been twisted and misapplied for heinous ends. Uh, Good laws wielded by unrighteous and wicked people are often misabused and misapplied. This is not new in history. Uh, Charles Simeon, a pastor of Holy Trinity Church in the 18th century, said this, To live under the government of laws that are wisely enacted and well administered is a blessing of no ordinary kind. But the best laws, if perverted to ends which were never contemplated by the legislature, may be sources and instruments of the most grievous oppressions. Good laws can be misused and misused applied. We need to think no further than the current crisis that we are experiencing. Earlier in this week, a church in Greenville, Mississippi decided to have a drive-in prayer service for our country in the midst of crisis. They gathered together, they followed self-distancing protocols, and they had the law on their side. Yet the government issued a decree against them and sent the police to them. And in the midst of our current financial burden and struggles, the police officers issued each of the congregants a $500 ticket. Good laws in order to protect health and uh, life within our country, miswielded and mis- and abused in order uh, by a tyrannical government uh, to bring uh, uh, destruction and harm to Christians uh, at this time. And good laws can be misused and misapplied. And, but we see this everywhere. You see this in the TV that we watch. My wife and I watched a murder mystery just the other night ago. And we saw a very rich man die. And he left all of his wealth to the nurse that cared for him in his time of need. And his rotten family, none of them even deserving even a cent of this inheritance. These privileged folks uh, sought to use the full force of the law in order to win back what they believed was their inheritance. Good laws can be misabused. And that is what we have in 1 Timothy here before us today. The false teachers within the church are taking these good laws, these good laws given by God, and they are wielding, twisting them in order for their own ends. These rotten false teachers are seeking to misuse the law of God in order to bolster themselves up in their own self-righteousness. In our own time, though, The law of God has come under the same sort of great scrutiny. Some Christians uh, in our churches today argue that the Ten Commandments, that the law of God has no relevance for our church. And then uh, they use passages just like this to defend that Christians need not the law of God. We often call these folk in uh, pastoral circles antinomians, anti law. These are lawless people. They say that it doesn't matter how much you sin. Just look at Jesus. 
He will save you. You do not need the law. You do not need to become more holy. Just live lawlessly. We have those kind of people, even in our own church, even in our own denomination, even in our own country. But we have on the other spectrum, the just as gross and heinous of a group. They are called neonomians, new law. These are the people that we would describe as legalists. They wield the law of God and argue that if they obey the law, then they will be justified by God. These people do not need Christ because if they obey the laws of God, they will be saved. And I believe that is what the false teachers in Ephesus are teaching here, that they are perfect, that they live the law perfectly, and since they live the law perfectly, God will save them. But the remedy to both of these problems, to both the lawlessness and the legalism, the self-righteousness, is not more or less law. You might think the lawless just need the law and that the self-righteous need a little less law. No, they need the gospel. For it is in the gospel that the law becomes both the revealer of our sin and the school teachers of our hearts. Therefore, use the law lawfully. How do Christians use the law lawfully? First, You use the law lawfully when you recognize that the law is good. We see that in verse 8. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Uh, Paul begins by being somewhat comical. He says, we know that the law is good. He, He is saying this in a manner that everybody who has any sort of sense knows that the law of God is good. These false teachers who are beginning to question the law, uh, that begin to cast doubt on the law, they are the ones that are on the outside. They are the ones with the odd beliefs. They are the ones with the odd views because anyone who has any common sense knows that the law of God, since it is given by a good God, is a good law. If you go back to the book of Exodus, you are reminded in Exodus chapter 20, the whole of the Ten Commandments. How how do the Ten Commandments begin? I am the Lord your God. They are God's people. And then he gives them his law. Salvation first, and then soon after comes the law. Salvation, rescue from the Egyptian enslavement. God has redeemed his people out of bondage. And then at Sinai, he gives them the law. He saves them first and then gives them the law. And therefore, it is a good law. It is a good law when it is lawfully used. In our great tradition, in the Reformed faith, how do we use the law lawfully? Well, theologians have argued about this for centuries, and we have come away with three ways that Christians are to use the law lawfully in our own lives. The first way, the common way, is that the law restrains evil within our land. Uh, Theologians call this the civil use of the law. The governing bodies of our lands wield the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments, in order to restrain evil within our land. Uh, You can see this explicitly within our laws. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not lie. Uh, These are common laws that are variously applied in our own country. Uh, The Lord chooses to use the law, the law that he has written on every man's heart, every man and woman's heart, to restrain evil in our land. If he did not, If he withheld the law written on our hearts, then we would truly be a lawless people. For we would not know that murder is evil. We would not know stealing is wrong or that lying is heinous. We would think these things are neutral. But God has written upon our heart. And with the civil use of the law, he restrains evil 
in our own land. But the second, as for those who are, are the, for those who are Christians, we see that the law condemns our sin. This is the second use of the law. It reveals to us the holiness of God on the one hand. He is a holy God and he has given us a holy law. And if you read the law of God, you quite quickly realize that you cannot measure up to that law that you are a sinner, that you, you break the law of God regularly in thought, word, and deed, and it convicts you of your sin. It condemns you. This is the second use of the law. Augustine once wrote, uh, the law bids us as they try to fulfill its requirement and become wearied in our own weaknesses under it to know how to ask for the help of grace. What does the second law do to us as it reveals us our sin? The law becomes a tutor that leads us to our need of Christ and his redemption. This is a, it points us. It becomes our tutor. It shows us and reveals the need for Jesus Christ to come. And then the third use of the law. It is a guide for our sanctification. Christians have often called this the normative use. Why is it the normative use? It is because it is the most normal way that we use the law in our own lives. It guides us to live in accordance to God's way. It is the law for the Christian people. The law is not only for the lawless, but it is for those who are in Christ's church. It is a new code of life for you and I to live by. God has adopted you, if you are a Christian, as sons and daughters in his house, in his kingdom, and as children in his kingdom, he has given you these laws to abide by as you are under his rule. Many of you in your own homes have rules in your households, especially if you have children in your households, and your children probably know by now that when they obey the laws, when they obey the rules, it often leads to blessing. But when your children begin to bend the rules, when they begin to misbehave, when they begin to break the laws in your house, what do you do? As good parents, you discipline them. They might be sent to bed early. They might not receive ice cream with the family this evening. In a similar manner, Christians live in the household of God. As children who love their father, their heavenly father, they seek to uphold his rules for life. And when they fail, when they break those rules that he has set up in his household, what does God do? He disciplines his children just like you discipline your children and draws them back to how they ought to live within the house of God. And we come to know as we grow that the, the laws, the rules that our parents put over us in our homes are for our own good, for our own prosperity. And that is what God does for his children. These laws are not mundane and arbitrary. They are good laws that lead us to holiness. And that is how we view the law. That is why it is good. It restrains evil in our society. It reveals sin and it sanctifies us. It makes us more holy as we seek to live out the law in order to please God. We are already saved. Remember, God has given us salvation and then the law. So how do you use the law lawfully? First, you recognize that it is good. Second, you learn the moral standards of God. And we see this in verses 9 and 10. Uh, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for the sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. This is a familiar list that Paul lays out right for us in this passage. The, the false teachers are trying to say that they are perfect, that they have lived out the law perfectly, and you can too. 
They are Christian perfectionists, and they are saying that you can live the law perfectly and God will be pleased, and you can continue for the rest of your life to live the law perfectly. But what does Paul say? What is his charge against this false teaching? This law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless. If the false teachers in Ephesus truly are perfect, this law is not for them. Who is this law for? It is for those who break the Ten Commandments. That is what this list reveals to us. It reveals the Ten Commandments of our God. Many in Christianity have argued that the Ten Commandments are not found within the New Testament and therefore we should just do away with them. Right here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, from verses 9 and 10, we get the whole of the Ten Commandments. We get the whole of them and the broad implications of them. And you might say, Scott, where are that? Where are they? Where are the first four commandments? Sure, I see honor your father and mother, murder and adultery, but where are no other gods, no idols, uh, no cursing the name of the Lord and honoring the Sabbath? Where are they in this list? We see it quite clearly with the first four uh, 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 modifiers in these verses. In verse 9, the law is for who? For the ungodly and the sinner. The ungodly, those who have no other gods. The sinner, those who idolize false gods and worship God incorrectly. Uh, For those who are unholy, those who take the Lord their God's name in vain. And for the profane, those who profane the Sabbath day. You might say, is this a stretch, Scott? Where do you get this from? These are common words throughout the the whole of the Old Testament that refer to these commands. Whenever you see the ungodly in the Old Testament, it refers to the godless. Whenever you see sinners, we see that it refers to the idolaters. Whenever you see the unholy, it is for those who profane and curse God and for those who profane, those who fail to worship God in Anon is Sabbath. We see the whole of the Ten Commandments, and the rest of the list, I think, is self-explanatory. But notice, I think the most striking thing about this list is that it gives us the most extreme and the most heinous violations of the Ten Commandments. They are the worst examples, uh, from profaning the Lord's Day to beating down your father and mother. How else to break this command of honoring your father and mother than to beat them down? From murder to acts of homosexuality, from the most, uh, uh, for the most heinous of thievery, man-stealing, enslaving, kidnapping, to perjury. Paul presents to us in this passage the most heinous examples of the Ten Commandments being violated most heinous examples. And what we learn from verse 9 and 10 is that wretched living leads to wretched theology. At the end, it says anything that is contrary to solid doctrine. Wretched doctrine leads to wretched living. How we live tells us a lot about who we are and what we believe. The Ten Commandments in and of themselves uh, in the Reformed tradition, if you look in your catechisms, are meant to be a synecdoche. Uh, that's a figure of speech that, re- that refers to a part representing the whole. Uh, you use this more often than you think. We often hear the phrase, there are boots on the ground. And you know what that means when we say there are boots on the ground. We do not literally mean that we have left some boots on the ground, but we mean that we have deployed soldiers to a specific region. If I say there are boots on the ground in Iraq, you know what that means. It means that we have sent soldiers to Iraq. Or maybe you say, I got some new wheels. Now, what do you mean? Do you mean that you bought some new wheels and you're storing them? No, you probably mean that you've bought a new car, that you have a new set of wheels. Uh, this is what the Ten Commandments do for us uh, in, in God's law, that do not murder. Does that mean explicitly just do not murder? And that's the only thing you have to do and you're obeying this command? No. 
Uh, Do not murder refers and is focused on the principle of promoting and maintaining life. It is against abortion. It is against euthanasia. Uh, It is against anything uh, that seeks to destroy life. It it is against binge eating or drinking because you are killing yourself. Uh, The Ten Commandments apply much further than what we believe. And if you open up uh, your Westminster Catechism, you'll see it to be true. I often, in our prayer of confession, go to the Catechism and go through commandment by commandment, picking out various sins that I know you and I struggle with. And I pray for them, that God forgives us of them. Because the Ten Commandments are just a part that represent the whole of the law of God. And what does that mean for us as Reformed folk? I think we tend in the Reformed tradition to be labeled as those folk with, that are just brains on sticks. You know, they are all intellectual and no experience. They have all their theological ducks in a row, but have no Christian living. Our personal piety often lags far behind our pristine theology. We're on the right track. We have upheld good, true doctrine in our churches today as we maintain it within our lives. But if our doctrine leads to lawlessness, it is no better than the false teachers in Ephesus. If our doctrine leads to lawlessness, it is no better than what Paul is dealing with in the church of Ephesus. Do not hide behind predestination. Do not hide behind the sovereignty of God to justify your lawless behavior. It doesn't work. And what Paul is saying here is that bad, wicked doctrines will lead to bad practice. Let it not be so in the Reformed tradition. Let us uphold the true, historic, great doctrines of the faith Let us live out that doctrine by seeking to be children in God's house and maintaining his law. Use the law lawfully. How do you use the law lawfully? You recognize that it is good. You learn the moral standards of God. And finally, you believe that the law works with the gospel. This is the key in the passage, that the law works with the gospel. And we see this in the latter part of verse 10 and 11. Whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Sometimes as we approach the law of God, we seek to drive a wedge between the law and the gospel. We try to think and separate them as two contrary doctrines that can't cohabitate and exist side by side. But what Paul does at the end of his section in understanding the law of God, what he does is he promotes the gospel. And what we see in that promoting the gospel is that Paul is trying to show us, to show you that there is more continuity, that there is more unity between the law of God and the gospel that he has given to us. For on the, on the one hand, the law condemns us like it did Israel for their unbelief. Now this commendation, the condemnation is gracious. Why? Because it points us to the need of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we learn in the gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ alone is the perfect keeper of the law of God. Those who believe in Christ are not saved according to their own works, according to their own obedience to the law, but they are rather saved by Christ's perfect obedience to the law. The law shatters us as it reveals our sin and our need for the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we approach God, there is no righteousness in us apart from the righteousness of Christ given to us. And we enter into a new relationship with the law as we become Christians. For at one moment, the law was a taskmaster over us, convicting us of our sins, further pushing us down like a slave driver. But now, in love and in Christ, it becomes the very means of serving God in holiness. 
only an awesome and glorious God can use such a good law that burdens us with our sins and to use that same law, the same words that once convicted us, now he uses it to promote holiness within us as his children. It is the glory of the most glorious, blessed God as this passage gives us. And what does it say at the end? Who is this gospel? Who is given this key? It is entrusted to Paul. Paul, the chief of sinners. The unholy Paul, the apostle, the preacher. From being condemned by the law to growing in holiness with the law. He has given and entrusted this work to his apostle, to his apostle's protege, to Timothy, to me, to Randy, to use the gospel in order to, to promote a right use of the law. We need the gospel to use the law lawfully. I once attended a young adult ministry at a multi-campus church. I didn't have any um, college ministries that I could attend at the school I was, so I attended this, uh, this young adult ministry. And while I was there, they had a worship-styled service, and then they would break out after in order to have some small groups. And I always uh, had a disdain for the small groups. They were just uncomfortable and odd, personally, for me. And I was in my cage stage of Calvinism, so it certainly wasn't good ground for me. But reluctantly, from time to time, I would go. And I remember whenever we would talk about anything, the common phrase that would be prefaced before giving any sort of answer would be something like this. I don't want to sound like a legalist, but, a great phrase, I heard it five, six times every time I attended. I do not want to sound like a legalist, but I think we should baptize babies. I do not want to sound like a legalist, but I think I should get baptized again. I don't want to sound like a legalist, but I think we should use wine in communion. I don't want to sound like a legalist, but maybe we should have uh, the Lord's Supper every week. Everything that was doctrinal, that was dogmatic, they prefaced with, I don't want to sound like a legalist. What were these Christians fearful of? They were fearful of the law. They viewed that if they made any sort of dogmatic statement, they would be automatically legalists. Many Christians have come to the same conclusion that we must just give up doctrine altogether because we'll become legalists. That we must give up any sort of dogmatic statement because of fear of legalism and fear of the law. But Christians, you and I, are called to use the law lawfully. The law is not juxtaposed against the gospel. They are to be used together. That is why we need the gospel, because it is the key to unlocking the good use of the law for those who are Christians. It is the key. How do you use the law lawfully? It is through the lenses, through the glasses of the gospel. When you put those new glasses on, when you put the gospel on, the law begins to make sense. It begins to protect us as we rely on the gospel to protect us against legalism and lawlessness. For the gospel, it is the gospel itself that denies the legalists their view of earning salvation. And it is the gospel that denies the lawless their abounding in sin as the gospel itself reminds us that we are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. And so we as Christians, as the Christian church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are called to use the law lawfully. You know it. You know the law is good. You know that you learn the moral standards of God from the law. And you know that the law of God works with the gospel. We might be tempted like the false teachers to use the law the good law of God unlawfully. 
We might be like those in government in Greenville, Mississippi, who seek to wield the good laws that protect the citizens from COVID-19, to use those laws in order to set on their people that live in that town a financial burden that is already hard to deal with in our current crisis, uh, wielding good laws to heinous ends. Or you might be like the family in this murder mystery. You know you don't deserve it, but you want to use that law for your own good ends. Like the Christian perfectionists, we might seek to justify ourselves like the illegalists or to throw out the law of God like the lawless. But both of these approaches misunderstand Christianity. For the legalists, they deny the Christ that comes to save. And for the lawless, there is no God has come to save. Lawlessness, legalism are both errors and perversions of the gospel of our Christ because they both misunderstand grace. They mo- both misunderstand God, the gospel. They both misunderstand Christ and they both misunderstand the law of God. St. Clair Ferguson said that in one of his books that I was reading over the week, that 50% of his pastoral crises deal with the law of God. For on the one hand, he deals with the lawless, and on the other hand, he deals with the legalists. And as he has lived a long ministry, he has argued that it is almost one of these two problems that those who come into his office who seek help need to be corrected. They need the gospel. They need the key. They need the lens that allows them to approach the law of God and to wield it lawfully. As we close, I want you to be reminded of the great hymn, Trust and Obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. After this uh, recording, I would encourage you to look that song up and to sing it with your family. Let us close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your law, for it reveals to us our own sin. It is a tutor for us as it leads us to Christ, and it is a guide for us as we are children in your kingdom. May it be so that in our own households, even today, that we might privately worship you in family worship. Give us hearts of prayer. Give us hearts that desire to sing, and give us hearts to hear your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.